From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Cyber attacks accompany a Russian military assault on Ukraine, DocuSign used to steal Microsoft Outlook logins, and CISO releases a cybersecurity toolkit. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. Now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and most definitely some expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Mark Eggleston, the CISO at CSC. Mark, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. Really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Happy to be here. All right. Before we move on to the main show, we want to thank our sponsor, Tynes, no-code automation for security teams. Of course, you can join us on LinkedIn Live. Just go to CISOseries.com. The Week in Review page will have the link there. Just check it out. Join us. We've got about 20 minutes right now, though, so we need to dive right in. First up here, obviously the big story of the week, cyber attacks accompany Russian military assault on Ukraine. This is an ongoing breaking story, so the the facts on the ground will change uh, probably by the time we finish recording this. But in this first week of the invasion, the websites of Ukraine's defense, foreign and interior ministries were unreachable or slow to load after a wave of DDoS attacks. It's also impacted some banking sites. In addition, cybersecurity researchers said unidentified attackers had infected hundreds of computers with destructive malware, some in neighboring Latvia and Lithuania. Asset Research Lab said it detected a previously unseen piece of data wiping malware Wednesday on hundreds of machines in the country. We've heard some talk from Cloudflare that actually this isn't the peak of DDoS activity, but definitely has ramped up in the past week. You know, Mark, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, As expected, cyber is kind of a key battleground uh, in this conflict. I mean, what are your thoughts on the reported scale of these attacks? And, you know, surely this this isn't unexpected, uh, you know, sad as it is to say, right? Right. So, yeah, from what I understand, this was more like a pulsing kind of sporadic type attack. And they've done Mm -hmm. some, you know, as you say, distributed denial of service attacks. Also know what's really, really interesting. Speaking of evolving, just reading this morning that Anonymous is now banded together and has started to take on Russia. So, boy, oh, boy, I guess we all need to kind of just stay on the sidelines on this one. Uh, But some of the other stuff that was come from this article I found was interesting, too. I mean, it was a previously unseen piece of data wiping malware. I mean, ouch, that hurts. And then also, of course, no attrition. Can't really double, can't really confirm. But I think the suspicion that it's Russia's GRU is right on point. Yeah, and this this idea that you know we we've seen uh, uh, advanced persistent threats, uh, you know, obviously holding on to zero days. That's that's one of the things that for a lot of these uh, uh, you know security research people that sell security research tools, holding on to not disclosing these exploits. The reason that sometimes is frowned upon is because it allows other actors to maybe you know save up these exploits, use them in a situation like this conflict for sure. Mm-hmm. Indeed. All right. Uh, We'll definitely uh, be keeping an eye on that. So uh, uh, make sure you're subscribed to Cybersecurity Headlines to stay up to date on the latest uh, in that evolving situation. Our next up here, master key for Hive ransomware retrieved using a flaw in its encryption algorithm. Researchers have detailed what they call the first successful attempt at decrypting data infected with Hive ransomware without relying on the private key used to lock access to the content by using a cryptographic vulnerability identified through analysis. This is according to a group of academics from South Korea's Kukmin University. Hive is ranked as one of the top 10 ransomware strains by revenue in 2021. So, uh, you know, there's definitely some money there. And this kind of stemmed from the naming conventions for file names for the encrypted blobs uh, in Hive's implementation. Intriguing to see the good guys fight back, uh, developing ways to decrypt what was thought to be the the undecryptable. Uh, Mark, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think this is great news. I mean, number eight as far as revenue last year, I mean, that's busted. They're gone. So that's wonderful. Uh, At least gone at 95% of the time, right? Because it's not going to work in all cases. But 95%, I'll definitely take those odds. I mean, that's impressive. Um, You know, cryptology is uh, probably one of my least favorite domains <laughs> in security, but from how I understand it, you know the very XOR uh, XOR operation that they were using in alternate blocks allowed them to reverse engineer it and uh, you know guess the key streams with, without even having the uh, attacker's private key. So I'd love to see more of this take off and help us build our kit. So when we inevitably do get these type of ransomware attacks, we've got a nice library of all these uh, decryption keys there for us. 
Yeah, and I wonder if through more analysis, we'll see, you know, all of these ransomware families are, are borrowing or stealing or whatever you want to say from each other. Right. They, a lot, There's a lot of uh, common shared ancestry, right? So mm-hmm. maybe this approach could lead to further uh, uh, decryption attempts going forward, even if not at 95%, right? That's true. There's no honor among thieves. <laughs> no, no. What, what is it? Uh, 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 genius uh, steals, right? That's the Steve, <laughs> jo- Steve Jobs quote. So, Oh, yeah. Some of my best presentations are ones that I've pil- pilfered off others. <laughs> uh, so yeah, some some good news there, and we've we've seen keys leak before and stuff like that. We've seen br- technology advance where we can brute mm-hmm. force, you know, older ransomware strains. But uh, a really interesting approach to uh, to kind of fundamentally find uh, data exfiltration in the file names. Very cool stuff. Uh, next up here, new phishing campaign targets Monzo online banking customers. Monzo is an online banking platform in the UK with over 4 million customers. It was hit recently with a phishing scam that used faked SMS text asking customers to reactivate their session or verify their account info. Monzo states that it does not use SMS to communicate with customers. There's you know, nothing in the story we haven't seen before here, Mark. That's kind of actually why we wanted to include in the show, you know, why does this technique still work? And is there anything that we can do to prevent it? Like this is, you know, this is tale as old as time, right? Uh, I mean, the old (laughs) adage of education is certainly something that's going to be one of your last lines of defense. But why does it still keep happening? Why does it work? I mean, two reasons off the bat, right? I mean, although Mongo came out and said, we don't use this form of communication, Certainly, many, many other B2C companies continue to do this. I've seen it highly prevalent in mobile space. I've seen it highly uh, prevalent in uh, payment card space, too. So I think as long as people are still out there using it, it's nothing unusual for somebody to get a link and say, click here and then put in your credentials. Um, I think most twi- most people just don't think twice about, you know, it being a reputable channel. Um, I think the other reason is, you know, just like Willie Sutton robs banks, uh, cyber criminals are going to go where the money is. So what, what does that mean? It's social engineering. Um, you know, there's probably more complex ways to get somebody's monies, get somebody's com- uh, credentials. But if you can send them a link and they just do it because they just can't help themselves, I mean, that's 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 gold right there. So I don't, you know, I, I think that you're going to continue to see these type of things. But you know what? The, the same old guidance from yesteryear applies here. Just don't log on to a page after any hyperlink sent to you uninitiated. Just don't do it. Just, just don't do it. No, no, the cost of notification fatigue, maybe, uh, yeah. uh, kind of hitting back at everybody. Next up here, cyber attackers leverage DocuSign to steal Microsoft Outlook logins. This is a phishing campaign that was directed at an unnamed integrated payment solution company located in North America, and it used email phishing that directed the company's employees to fake DocuSign contracts. Like our previous Monzo story, not a new theme. We've seen this before on the show, but the kicker here is that the originating address was legitimate, belonging to Term Broker Insurance. So anyone checking the from field would have re- perceived it as legitimate. This is kind of the opposite side, uh, you know. Assuming this wasn't like typo squatting or something like that, this is kind of the opposite side of here, where mm-hmm. we've we've trained people to look for this kind of stuff. Someone would have looked for this kind of stuff and still gotten pwned. Where do we go from here? Well, I think this is, you know, just like we've learned in security profession about, you know, defense in depth, the bad guys have learned about layered deception. So you're absolutely right. You get this, you do the checks, you know, grammar checks, check the domain of the sender, et cetera, and all passes. So you click on it. But like you said, um, uh, we we got a lot of these in my prior role in healthcare. We'd have a ma and pa shop, a small provider. Their email would get hacked. And then they'd say, oh, you're a DocuSign or you're whatever this customer. We'll send you that invoice. We'll send you that marketing campaign. And then that part is hijacked. That's where you get the payload. So you see people using this type of layered deception. And again, I don't think this is going anywhere. I think, you know, this is major that uh, DocuSign. Uh, I think that's always getting a lot more headline attention when you have two big names in the same storyline. But, you yeah. know, uh, again, go, go back to old, uh, old guidance here. If, it, if you're not expecting that invoice, if you're not expecting that marketed communication, Pick up the phone in old school security. We call it out of band communication, but pick up the phone and say, hey, did you send this to me? You know, did you want it? I don't think we have a statement of work coming across here. I'm not sure why you would be sending me an invoice and, you know, double check it. Verify the person before you open those things up. All right. Before we move on to our next story, we want to spend a few moments with our sponsor, Tynes. Tynes is hosting a virtual game show in conjunction with Lacework on March 8th. It's free to attend with cybersecurity trivia, fun prizes, and donations going to good causes like women in cybersecurity. Places are limited, though, so head over to tines.com slash game show to register. 
Moving on here, logistics company pauses operation due to ransomware. The Seattle-based Expeditors International was forced to shut down most worldwide operations over the weekend after the result of a cyber attack it described as, quote, a significant event. While the company did not mention the exact nature of the attack, bleeping computer sources say this is the result of a mansom, ran, massive ransomware incident, easy for me to say. This impacted the company's freight, customs, and distribution activities while it attempted to restore from backups. Expeditors did not provide an estimate when operations would resume, kind of you know, signaling just how serious this is. You know, Supply chain ransomware events turning into maybe like the economic version of climate change creeping up on us kind of no one wants to put it together to, to see kind of, hey, this is this is like a giant danger that we all need to deal with here. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, supply chain bottlenecks impacting everything from the ship block in the Suez Canal to attacks on Colonial Pipeline and now uh, Nord Stream 2 in Europe. You know, do you think uh, government should have something more to do to oversee supply chain safety or would that be, you know, overreach, Mark? Um, you know, when when a certain sector gets a whole lot of bad into it, I think that's probably a good sign that for government to start to look into that, especially if private companies aren't doing something themselves to fix that, right? So I think mm-hmm. that's the answer to that question. When I looked at the story, I found some good information in it, though. Um, you know, so much of the time you see this was a sophisticated attack. You know, they just got breached. How do you even know it's sophisticated? I think they say that to try and protect themselves. Refreshingly, I saw in this story they called it a significant event, which seems like, you know, I'll give them an A plus for honesty there. You know, with 10 billion in revenue, you'd think they would have a more robust security mail gateway, maybe some employee education. But in all honesty, I don't, I don't want to ding the company. I don't know enough. And I don't think most people do until more details come out of here. It's hard to, you know, second guess without knowing a little bit more, especially when you have these breaking stories. All the details are really scant because they're still trying to fin- figure out what the heck's going on. Um, you know, I think there's another silver lining in this as well. When I read through it, they talked about employees leveraging back backup procedures and alternative solutions to support customers. So my guess is maybe they didn't pay the ransom. Maybe they're emphasizing again that they use their business continuity plans, their DR systems. Those are two good things too. So uh, I might add a couple of these things to our own business continuity PR scripts. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely, for sure. Well, that's what it got me thinking is the business continuity and DR uh, uh, implications of this. You know, being a logistics company, probably having very distributed operations probably adds more of a challenge to that. I, you know, I don't know, you know, what their exact infrastructure looked like, but I imagine that makes the the process of spinning everything back up from, you know, however cold those backups are, that much harder and longer for them to kind of get back on track. So yeah, uh, they're know. a massive company. They, I can't imagine doing third party vendor risk management at that company. Can you imagine the supply chain risk they have? Oof. Yeah. Yeesh. Uh, moving on here, CISA releases cybersecurity toolkit. Speaking of the government, CISA has published a guide with free cybersecurity resources and services to help organizations with incident response. This includes resources to reduce risk exposure before an attack and tools to help after security incidents. Software provided in the guide includes open source tools and other CISA specific software. The guide advises organizations to regularly patch software, implement multi-factor authentication, upgrade unsupported software, and replace default passwords. Mark, seems like a lot of table stake recommendations, at least, aside from the tools, but what's your take on this development? Yeah, Rich, I had the same kind of feeling when I first started reading it. You know, do patching, do your MFA, you know, don't run into life software. We've heard those things all before. But, you know, I got to give a lot of kudos to Jen Easterly. I think she's doing a phenomenal job over there. Um, She's vocal on social channels. Um, She's talking about some of the challenges we all have, like recruiting in cyber and so much more. Um, When I, you know, once you get past the basics on this, and I think the, the, the cautionary note here is you still need some competence staff to take action on a lot of the things that are in that guide. But wow, there's a ton of stuff in there. Um, uh, From a glance at it, I mean, they have an automated recurring vulnerability scan. Again, if you're a small, medium-sized business, you're going to get automated vulnerability scans sent to your inbox on a weekly basis. That's pretty powerful stuff. And some of the other larger vendors giving themselves, like CrowdStrike, having a free tool to reduce um, over-permissive permissions on Azure. That's phenomenal. I mean, those type of toolkits just right there at your fingertips. So then the um, open source intelligence tool, uh, stuff off search, uh, yeah, just a whole library of other tools that you can really help you know, reduce the um, uh, attack surface, you know, which is a, a, a more recent 
uh, topic. So I'm seriously impressed with the amount of tools that they've made available to folks. And, you know, hopefully people that aren't sure where to take their cyber career, it's a great tool for you to look to because you can use all these resources and pick up a skill set. Uh, it's not going to cost you a dime. Yeah, and and I like your your perspective there about the impact for small and and medium businesses because you know those are the situations where you're probably dealing with IT generalists, maybe one or you know maybe one dedicated security person, if that. So you know while these may be table stakes, uh, it it never hurts to educate. And like you said, some very powerful tools there uh, to to make it to make the, at least the spend conversation that much easier for your team, right? Yep. All right, moving on here. Meta received a draft of EU US data transfers. Meta made headlines a few weeks ago when it stated in a regulatory filing it may be forced to suspend service in the EU due to the shifting laws around data transfers to the U.S. This impacts Meta's ability to transfer data to the U.S., although it's unclear what exactly is in this ruling, just that they've received it. Probably still a long way away from Meta being forced to you know, stop data transfers wholesale, but this decision likely means there's still regulatory movement in that direction. This is kind of, if you've not been following this, this has been going on for years of frameworks being created, invalidated by European courts, and then scrambling and redoing frameworks repeat ad nauseum. Mm -hmm. You know, not ex this kind of feeds into this overall narrative, not a great year for tw last 12 months for Facebook and now Meta. It appears to have significant implications for an organization that effectively operates without borders. You know, Mark, I'm just curious about your thoughts about, you know, this kind of continuing process. Well, you know, Mama always said, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything <laughs> at all. So it's hard for me to comment about Facebook or Meta, right? Um, so I'll keep it more generic. Uh, with GDPR and uh, Europeans, you know, more sensitivity to privacy, you know, I, I applaud them for, you know, saying, hey, you have to be careful with this kind of stuff. This doesn't really pass muster. So, you know, it's kind of a wake up call that, you know, uh, this is the way we probably should be doing things. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not shedding a tear for Meta just, just yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ultimately, like the worst case scenario is they have to build European data centers, right? Like, uh, obviously, that's a huge, you know, multi billion dollar expense for them, but it's right. not, I, I don't think this is an existential crisis, just a line item for them at some point down the road if, if nothing gets resolved, right? It's not. With their purses and things that they have at their disposal, I'm sure if they try hard, they'll find some other way around this. Maybe they'll, you know, make a few less billion this month or something, but, you know, they'll find a way beyond this. Also, Mark, I'm glad your mama didn't say knock you out. So that would have been different <laughs> advice for Meta. And finally, here, our last story, U.S. Copyright Office says AI can't copyright its art. Last week, the U.S. Copyright Office reviewed a 2019 ruling against Stephen Thaler, who tried to copyright a picture on behalf of an algorithm he dubbed Creativity Machine. A three-person board found that Thaler's AI-created image didn't include an element of human authorship, which is, which is a necessary standard for the protection. The board stated, the court has been consistent in finding that non-human expression is ineligible for copyright protection. As AI becomes a bigger part of artists' repertoire, the limits of copyright laws could be tested in years to come. You know, Mark, I suppose that without AI-based art algorithms, we'll just have to satisfy ourselves with more substantive human artistic creations like exploded Lamborghinis or NFTs of Melania Trump's hat or something, you know, with that kind of integrity. Do you think it's fair for the world to be denied ownership of AI-based art and kind of corollary, given the increase in AI-based coding? Mm hmm would, you know, I'm interested if there's maybe some intellectual property follow ons, you know, kind of for the wider IT industry. Yeah, I think, you know, AI has been less buzzworthy for whatever reason the last several months. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, what I recall with um, artificial intelligence is that you have your own biases is baked into it, right? And that's one yeah. of the cautionary tells. Like if you're using AI to screen for resumes, be careful because your, your biases are integrated when that AI was developed. So it's telling me that there's probably a big chunk of humanism in AI. So I'm not necessarily in full agreement with this because, you know, there is a piece of, of humanism and, and human thought when they develop this AI. I think uh, you're going to continue to see this challenged. Um, you know, I don't know, like, well, I th haven't animals painted pictures too? Didn't those go for sale? I mean, I, uh, where do you draw the line in this kind of stuff? Maybe they so need they to can, slap it into They can go NFT. for sale, but there was a monkey that took a selfie and the <laughs> monkey could not get copyright on the image. I have followed this case. It's weird. I don't know why I wow. know that. <laughs> that is some interesting <laughs> knowledge there. So what what I would say is it's this is an this is an issue I feel like where either the standard for human involvement has to be like yeah I changed 
X amount of mm-hmm. pixels in this image or whatever, you know, whatever the artwork has to be to be human involvement seems like a fairly trivial exercise. Or this is an instance like you were mentioning, Mark, where there is a, a copyright uh, a catch-up that needs to happen. And this is just the Copyright Office applying existing law even if they might possibly think that it needs to get updated in the near term, right? You, you see, Rich, that's just the kind of thinking I'm talking about. Well, how can you pack this whole patent thing and get past it? So yeah, that's the way to do it. Put a little human flair in there and all of a sudden now it is yours. Exactly. Well, I, that's that's what patents are. They're like a list of things that's like, here, break one of these. It's now you can, now you don't have this patent against you. Like exactly. <laughs> it's not, it's, it, they, it, that's what it's there for, folks. I like your thinking. I, Mark, before we get out of here, any thumbs up or an eye roller story uh, in today's lineup that just kind of struck your fancy? Uh, I mean, I think the one that we ended with here was definitely interesting because I can't see that really sticking. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, as far as one of the more valuable ones, again, back to Jenner, Easterly's group and CISA, that's an impressive toolkit out there. I encourage all your listeners to go out there, whether they're a security pro or a security novice, and you'll probably see some links in there. It'll be valuable. And especially, you know, it's so many folks are talking about how to break into cyber. Well, you have a guide there that's telling you all these tools that you can use and learn, and it's not going to cost you a dime. So do take advantage of that. All right, Mark Eggleston, the CISO at CSC. Where can people find you uh, if they are so inclined to follow your work? And are you hiring? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. I have a Twitter uh, account, but it's rather minuscule. So LinkedIn is probably the best place to catch me. And am I hiring? Yes, we are hiring as a company. My peers in enterprise technology are hiring, and we have about three positions in cybersecurity open right now. So I'd encourage you to hit me up on LinkedIn, check out our website, and uh, be happy to talk to you about any of the positions you're seeing out there. It's a great company. Well, Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, Really great conversation, and I I really appreciate your time. Likewise. Thanks for having me. All right. We also want to thank our sponsor, Tynes, no-code automation for security teams. Remember to come back next week for our Friday video chat all about hacking, automated response, and hour of critical thinking about more than just endpoint response capabilities. That starts at 10 a.m. Pacific or 1 p.m. Eastern, depending on uh, where you're at, followed by a meetup, and then we'll be back with another edition of the Week in Review. That's at Friday at 12.30 p.m. Pacific, 3.30 p.m. Eastern. That's how I remember it. You can still, of course, get your daily news fix through the Cybersecurity Headlines podcast. It's every single day, six minutes, gets you caught up on everything you need to know. Until next week, I'm Rich Straffolino, reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.